Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Dr. John Owens, who is here to talk about the history of street drumming. John, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, um, really, really excited about this one because you sent a book over called Street Drumming, The People, History, and Grooves, and um, I've really been enjoying it. Um, it is it just is a really nice book that has tons of great information in it. And I was mentioning to you before we started, it's it's very like digestible and real and usable. Not that other books aren't, but it's almost like a uh, like a pocket guide, like a handbook on how to get into it and the history and really usable tips um, for street drumming. So I really appreciate you sending this um, awesome book over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, we'll, we'll get into the book and um, on all this good stuff, but why don't we start off with the history of street drumming? And then later on, we'll hear more about your experiences with it. Cause you've done some cool stuff yourself, but um, where does street drumming begin? Yeah, well, that that's that is the question, right? So, thinking about street drumming, I guess historically or its roots and origins, um, you have to have a street uh, for there to be street drumming. So, I think you know st the starting place is probably about five thousand years ago. It could be a little bit before that, but Persian bazaars are probably some of the oldest street markets in the world, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably like the oldest space where drumming starts to occur. We see street drumming also in Egyptian societies, eventually kind of moving forward uh, into the Middle Ages. Um, there's an instrument called, or a kind of duo, where drummers slash pipe players would play something called the pipe and tabor. The tabor is just basically a single, you might have heard of it before. Yeah, a little um, bit, yeah. Yeah, so there's like one, like they hold one, they basically have a drum on the side, and they play like a tin whistle the other, and they're drumming around. But these these musicians, you know, whether they're minnesingers or troubadours, or minstrels, depending on what you know country you're in, they would kind of go around and jam, and they would do this in different parts in different cities. Uh, from there, we go into kind of a jump, the Renaissance. Uh, th those would be the same musicians, kind of in the Renaissance. Um, later on, we get into um, street drumming, kind of in like New Orleans. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the oldest street drumming in New Orleans occurred in a place called Congo Square which was a um, gathering place for enslaved people where on Sundays they could get together and kind of jam and drum. And so they would use these West African traditions and homemade instruments, and they'd just start kind of, you know, playing and grooving. And this, of course, stems into, you know, eventually being a precursor to jazz sure. and blues and some other styles. Um, and then from there, you end up in New Orleans also, which is really – New Orleans is such an epicenter. Uh, there's so much. Even today, if you go to New Orleans, it is not hard to find a street drummer. Just walk down any street, and you you know you see them. Yeah. So the that street drumming tradition then morphs into these things called spasm bands, where there's these kids that are like kind of they would sell newspapers and they were kind of on the streets and they were orphans and they would go out and they would they would drum. Um, they'd also play like kind of homemade like bass fiddles and bucket instruments and all sorts of stuff. But there was always drummers with them. Um, and from there, London also had a bunch of traditions where there was, especially in the 1800s, um, there were musicians that were playing on the streets for like dance shows and like little puppet shows. Um, in the book, I actually, there's, I talk about Punch and Judy, uh, which is actually a medieval show. But mm -hmm. in the 1800s, there was an account of it. And, and there was an interview in this book by a guy named Mayhew where he, he actually talks to the drummers, uh, to one of the drummers, and he was like the side man. But he would sit there and drum while the show was going on. And there's a great kind of etching of him, just kind of like, you know, on this old school rope tension drum. Um, oh, that reminds me, I skipped one, and that is colonial drumming, which is a big part of that. And um, beyond just rudimental drumming styles, there were colonial drummers that were hired as street drummers before like a, a town might like have a bell, mm -hmm. they would have a drummer roam the streets and play like little rhythms and grooves to be like, it's time for church. It's time. to Yeah. Get Is that kind of the, um, like, like the tattoo, um, sort of, uh, with, with that, that history with like the, the Washington tattoo and all that stuff where they would, I know that was, uh, with Mark Riley with which there was an episode, he talked about that stuff about 
they would use it to tell people like, all right, time to leave the bar or time to go home <laughs> and stuff like that. That's exactly it. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly the tradition. Yeah. And Raleigh's actually referenced in my book. So he, but yeah, so that right there is a great, a great example that there's, um, you know, they would go around and basically telling people there's a instance I have in my book about a guy named Jeremiah Howe. That actually might be the, I don't remember who, sure. who I referred it uh, from, but he, that was his gig. Like he was hired to basically be a street drummer roam the streets and he would, and that we have, um, there's evidence of his contracts and stuff mm. related to that, which is, which is pretty cool. That is cool. And there's like utilitarian, so I mean, it wouldn't count as street drumming at all, but I've, I've heard and seen the pictures of like when fire stations used to use a drum to like, let people know there's a, there's a fire or there's something going on with that, uh, as like an emergency warning. So, I mean, that definitely has more of like a utilitarian need as opposed to, performing to make extra like to make money which i mean you 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 talked about going back way five thousand years ago and i mean i guess it's a simple question it's it's the answer is obviously yes but people would be performing as a job to make money from the beginning right yeah well i think when you th the persian bazaar probably i would that one's a hard one because there's ev basically the evidence shows that there were social elements and there was music that existed and, oh, and thinking see. about the instruments that existed, they would have been things like, like the daff or the tar, which are mm -hmm. these kind of simple frame drums, but like the, the details, we don't know. We don't know sure. what they did, how they played, were they, you know, were they asking for tips? Um, and even in the middle ages, a lot of the references actually kind of, um, there's one actually Francis Darwin, the son of Charles Darwin, he wrote about street drummers. He kind of did like an investigation of the Middle Ages. Um, and he said that they were basically street urchins and vagabonds. <laughs> and like he kind of ripped on them a little bit and looked at them as kind of degenerates. You know, drums have a way of they're so loud. And uh, I could see people being annoyed by street drummers, which I'm sure we'll talk about later with getting kicked out of places. But Drummers have been annoying people since uh, for thousands of years, I guess, is the takeaway, which, you know, we love it. But um, that's that's so interesting that it goes. I mean, drums, we we all know it as drummers, but it it's like the oldest instrument in the world. So, of course, people have been doing this stuff for a, a very, very long time. Yeah. And I, I mean, of course, I've I skipped like, the you know, the the alligator drum and the cave paintings, you know, because those were used communally. But those didn't really have streets right involved. And I think for it to be considered street drummer drumming, there has to be a uh, urban space. Yeah. And even uh, when you get into more modern times, I mean, it seems like there's, there's a difference. And you talk about it in your book about like bucket drumming and like bucket boys versus like a guy who sets up a full drum set, which people do as well, or a little like kind of like trap kit. So it seems like there's a lot of uh, uh, vernacular, differences that you can you know you can split out into but um but that's that's getting further ahead but um okay so colonial and then we were into the the uh new orleans which is kind of obviously an epicenter of everything um which you you have great photos in your book um which obviously people know this by now but i'll put the put the link to the book in the description so they can check it out and, and your website and all that stuff there's a lot of effort in those photos yeah. and there's a couple iconic ones um, you know, kind of moving into the next generation of drummers, there's a guy named Gene Palma, who's almost like, you know, one of the kind of godfathers of yeah. what we think of as modern street drumming. And Gene Palma, there's a great picture of him by Cameron Block, uh, who was like there back in like the like late 70s, 80s. It's iconic. But anyways, with him, he's he started drumming basically after this there was from 1934 to the 1960s uh, street performing was banned in New York city. Um, mm. LaGuardia. It's funny now that I hear, when I hear that name, I'm like, Oh, LaGuardia airport. Yeah. But he actually purposefully banned musicians from playing on the streets wow. from that, from that lot, from that period of time. And so then there was this thing called the beatnik riots and where basically street performers eventually started being able to come out again. And Gene Palma was like the first like solo drummer. And uh, what what he would do is he would go out and he would he would basically he was kind of like a reenactor of um, Gene Krupa, and he 
and he would play like verbatim, like, you know, he'd play like sing, sing, sing. And he'd also do some like little buddy rich licks and some other things, but he had this like greasy jet black hair that he would mat down. Um, and he was really dynamic character. Um, he, I love like, there's a short of him on the film taxi. Uh, and then there's some, there's some documentaries of him and stuff. He's pretty easy to find. Um, but he is super important in the New York city um, street drumming scene. Yeah. In, uh, in taxi driver, when you see him, I mean, he is like a caricature of just, I don't even know what, I mean, it's the, the hair and Gene group is syncopated style and he's playing and yes. then it's, it's, um, uh, it's a great movie. I mean, that's obviously not one to watch with your kids or something, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no. but it's a great movie and it really, I mean, he is, uh, important and, uh, I'm glad that it's documented in a movie, like in like a major, major movie like that. Um, which is really cool. I didn't know that it was it was uh, it was banned street drumming. I wonder if it was because it's just like like you said, where it's like street urchins, like get off. You know, you're you're bothering people. It's which we don't see it that way, but uh, officials might. You know. Well, so in New York City, it wasn't specific to drummers. The ban was for all musicians. I see. And I see. Like, and peddlers and street performers. So they had like this fairly strict law for a really long time. And if you think about the thirties, right, you're getting into, you know, there's, there's a, it's a pretty interesting time, right? There's a lot of control elements, progressivism and so on and so forth happening around those times. Yeah. However, there were places that very specifically banned drums um, very clearly. Um, there's, there's a place, uh, Rome, Georgia in 1909, they had a ordinance that very specifically targeted drummers it was like if you're playing anything percussion related if you hit it or whatever it's against the law and wow. i do talk about that and the reason it's I, I actually call that um chapter war on drums because there is this direct targeting and the issue is not so much that maybe a one single town does it though that's a bummer for that drummer that you know was probably the reason it got started <laughs> yeah. but it sets a precedent and so then we see right after that kind of first instance of this drum ban, it then perpetuates and other cities start copying and copycatting. And so then we see this kind of drummers are no longer allowed, which is a bummer. The, the timeline there of you're saying like 1930s ish, uh, it's let's say it's bad timing because everyone kind of knows 1927 ish is when the the silent movie, that whole industry of drummers working in theaters and having this big booming, you know, 10,000 drummers per city or whatever. I forget. There's some some number like that. Uh, so they lost that job. Then there's it's basically made illegal in a lot of places for street performers to perform on the street to make a living. So it almost seems like, a you know, well, you can't get a job in a theater playing with a movie because that's over. And now you can't go out on the street and perform so it seems like it was pretty hard times to make it uh, as a drummer. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sure. I mean, and, and drummers of our, we're always, you know, one of the things I, one of the things I bring out in this book, and of course myself being a, a street drummer in Washington, DC, um, along with, you know, some of my other things, but the, I think the thing that's really interesting is that street drumming really allows drummers to be the solo instrument, you know, where we're in most cases, we're kind of backup, right? And totally. you know, we're, yeah, we're, we're sitting there making sure the groove is laid down, you know, so the, the guitar and bass licks come out and the voice comes out really prominently. But in street drumming, it's an opportunity to be like, check this out. Here's this cool groove. Um, and I also emphasize that in the book, I talk about the grooves that are very popular, like dance rhythms and little shuffles and like all these different grooves. And it's interesting that they're always really what's most popular in a particular region. Like yeah. Europe has certain rhythms that are more popular than the United States. Yeah, I think you said that like in London, you'll hear more of like the EDM kind of like dance beats because that kind of music, I mean, it's popular everywhere, but but especially in, in Europe, that stuff is very popular, um, which so let's say nowadays you typically see these kind of uh drummers with buckets or whatever around like sporting events uh, around basically where people are. So it's almost like you need a street and then you need like a bunch of people to listen. <laughs> Has that yeah. always been, I mean, obviously it seems like going back as far as, you know, the, the Persian bazaars, 
they would try and be in the epicenter of uh, where the events are. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always a gathering place, right? So, I mean, we think of street drumming in kind of this sense of like, oh, somebody's sitting on a corner on a street and there's pedestrians. But one of the rules that's almost universal uh, in most cities, uh, for sure in England or like London, uh, for sure in Washington, D.C. even, is that as you're drumming on the street, you can't block traffic uh, and you can't block that pedestrian flow. And I know in Europe, I live, I had the opportunity to live in Europe for a few years. And in Germany, there are these areas called Fußgänger zones, which are like pedestrian walk zones. And those places would be a normal gathering place because there's no, there's not any car traffic. There's spots where people could kind of come up like to the side. I remember seeing street drummers in like Stuttgart or something like that. And one of the people in my book that I interview, uh, Carl, um, he's from uh, New Zealand and he ends up, you know, he plays in Auckland, right? He, you know, he plays in that really busy pedestrian zone, right? And he's the only guy who's like doing those street grooves, at least on buckets. Um, and so he kind of moves into a little corner and then people gather around, but that flow of traffic cannot be impeded. That's one of those, you know, important laws. Yeah. What about, um, all right. So in New York, I mean, it was banned, which, which I think, or, or street performers, I should say, but now when you go to New York or if you're in the subway, you see like the people have literally like badges where they are, they have permits to do this. When did the permits come into play? And, um, is that pretty much because i know here in cincinnati i don't think people have permits to perform on the street but it's obviously not as big of a uh you know city as new york how did was that when it did come back with gene palma and stuff did people have to get permits to perform back even back then not initially no so there's so permits are so we're talking about the i got us a lot of the legal stuff sure um but the the permits are varied so they depend on cities and sometimes even within a city there's a certain region um, one of the best examples of this is Las Vegas. So in Las Vegas, one of the hottest spots to play as a street musician is Fremont Street. I don't know if you've been there, but it's like it's the old part of Las Vegas, and it's kind of covered in these lights. It's used in a lot of old movies, you know, like Frank Sinatra or like the Ocean's Eleven movies, mm -hmm. where there's you know there's just there's it's just really cool. It's like really sure. bright, but they had they were overrun by these street musicians. And so in order to do something about it, they implemented a, um, they implemented like a permit system. And so for the most part, I kind of get into this argument of is permits good or bad? Mm -hmm. um, and there are, it, it's kind of a two-edged sword, right? It does allow some organization. It allows it where it spreads musicians out so that, you know, the sound of this drummer doesn't bleed into say, you know, this show over here of acrobats or, you know, somebody playing violin. Um, there's a fun video that I mentioned of Gordo, the drummer, who's probably, uh, he's probably the highest like viewed drummer on YouTube right now, street drummer. Um, and there's a video where he's sitting there playing um, and this violinist just in the middle of his set, sets like right in front of him, cranks the amp, and just starts going like, and he, and it's crazy because you wouldn't think a drummer could get drowned out, but Man. you can't hear him anymore. Are like not playing together. Like it was, no. I, I'm going to be louder than you. Cause I, like almost like competing for a spot, basically like I'm taking over. Yes. It, it, and who knows? Like it could have been a, I don't remember all the details of it. Cause it, he doesn't even mention that in like kind of the after discussion. Um, but this idea that, you know, it, more than likely just knowing kind of the way it goes maybe he was in that spot for too long based on the regulations of the city maybe mm. or maybe that was the normal spot of that violinist or that person just was a you know a butt and decided to go in i had to i clean that up a little yes. bit but you know yeah. but you know maybe he just came in and just started like yes yeah, whatever man wow I'm, I'm, i want to make money and yeah. he eventually has to give in and leave and it was crazy yeah man interesting it's a weird uh I mean, it's, it's competitive. I mean, you're, cause you're dealing with, uh, like real estate basic or, or locations where you're, you, this is a high, you know, you want to be on the busiest street that you can, where you're out of the way, but you're playing, um, which kind of seems like we're, we're historically speaking on the timeline, getting into more of that, the bucket drumming and stuff, which I think nowadays is what people really 
uh, it's what they equate it to as opposed to like, you know, colonial drumming or tambour or flute or whatever. So when did that become what we, we know today? Okay, so that's all right. So I did, there's a couple people I probably should talk about first. So yeah, so Gene Palma played on like a like he didn't have, he basically had a like initially had a snare drum, a floor tom, and like a cymbal, right? And he would stand and play, uh, and then eventually he moved. There's there's images of him and in interviews with him eventually moving to just a snare drum on a stand and a cymbal, and then there's even one time where he just has a snare drum on a satchel. Eventually, he actually loses his drums. And he just starts playing on metal and playing on um, the newspaper stands. And he would just drum on them. And there was an interview where he said, like, yeah, I basically lost my drums. And now I'm just jamming on these. But he was still making money doing it on kind of these obscure just things on the city streets. Now I want to move to another location, which is Texas. And there's a guy named Bongo Joe Coleman, uh, who is from like actually started playing in the late 50s 1960s and they weren't as restrictive in texas and bongo joe basically took 50 gallon oil drums and you know and we i think we usually associate those with um like a uh, like soca right with yeah um, like a steel drum kind of yeah yeah steel drums right pan, so pan like, drum, I, yeah exactly but he didn't use them in that capacity he used them like as basically a makeshift drum set he mm. he's like i don't have money for a drum kit so I'm going to grab these big old oil drums. He fashioned his own mallets, his own sticks. Cause like, cause obviously regular drumsticks on a oil drum is pretty flipping loud. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it's insane. We used, when I, I used to drum at, um, Knott's Berry farm and we had a part where we would do like these, like we had all these 50 gallon drums and it was just, they didn't even mic us for that part. Cause it was just, so freaking loud <laughs> anyway so they so he fashioned these things and what he would do is he would play these really cool polyrhythmic grooves uh usually like um west african caribbean style grooves and then he would sing over the top of them in fact i would say he would sing he'd talk to the audience he'd bark he'd oh. whistle he'd put all these cool antics and he's also a great example of like how street performers like interact with the crowd you know, like he was like a master of being like, hey, you know, and he like, oh, like a little kid with a dog. And he would interact with them in a very natural way. And he played at the New Orleans Jazz Heritage Festivals and, you know, back back in the 60s, 70s. He was recorded by Our Holy Records. Um, he even was on, he's also considered like in the history of Texas music to be an iconic figure. You know, wow. somebody that doing this research, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's really cool. Um, and fast and really fascinating character. Yeah. I mean, as you said, it's, it's a performer. It's almost like, uh, half the job is to entertain and to keep people going. And, uh, yeah. I mean, you can't take for granted too, that you're not doing a three minute song and then you're done. I mean, you're doing this for hours and hours typically I'm assuming. Right. I mean, I've usually only seen a street drummer perform for like 10 minutes and then I walk on, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're going and going for a while. Right. Yeah, so when I would go out to the streets in D.C., well, I lived there at the time, um, we would typically go out for a minimum of four hours, and we would play um, constantly. There's a guy in the book, his name is Chris Harris. Uh, he plays, uh, he's actually the like official bucket drummer for the Tampa Bay Rays, um, and he's also billed as having the fastest one one-handed roll. Right. And I'm, I don't think he's been like tested on the drumometer or whatever, <laughs> yes. you know, but it's still, it's, it's pretty impressive. Right. Yeah. And he's got that, you know, that technique, that rim, uh, you know, the, that I can't do it. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. The you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. And he's kind of mastered that technique. Yeah. But anyways, he, um, he talks about spending all day playing, you know, he'll do a set in the middle of the day in a busy place change location and he's playing eight 12 hours and he's also not only that but he's it's intense right it's it's not like you know you play a, a, a couple minute song and you're like oh cool you know oh we played our 45 minute set let's go get some sodas and you know drinks and then come back and do another set it's you know every second you're not playing you're losing money and yeah. so you know i think street drummers have a lot of calluses they have a lot of chops um and chris harris also mentioned uh, he was inspired by some of those bucket drummers you were talking about from the nineties that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but how they were just 
sheer power, you know, and, and he marched drum and bugle corps. Um, and he was like, you know, division one core. And he's like, um, he's like these guys, he's like, I don't, I have no chops. Like he's like compared to these people who are playing for hours at a time, single strokes, yep. you know, just like, you know, just going, he's like drum corps didn't even give me those chops, you know, <laughs> they gave me chops, but not yeah. in that way. Yeah. Oh man. Wow. I'm and do you think a lot of these drummers are, I mean, you can't know this for everyone, but are, are in your experience with like, um, I mean, you have background with the the army band. You have you've played at Disney. You've done a lot of stuff. But the average street drummer playing outside of a stadium are they typically like self taught, as far as you're aware, or are these guys going even going back, you know, into the '60s, '70s, '80s, or is it more of a, like you're taught by another street drummer, or is that kind of thing even even known really? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I think when you see a street musician. Um, even today that you don't know their background uh, because a lot of them have a lot of chops. Um, M- uh, Malik dope, who was recently on America's got talent. Um, he was a go-go drummer in Washington, DC, uh, but he also learned in school band. So he has that rudimental street drumming tradition. And when you watch him play, he's doing like, you know, all, he's doing high bombs and back sticking and you know, yeah. he's playing like cheeses and inverts. And, you know, he's doing all the cool stuff that, you know, we're like, you know, we're getting all nerdy as drummers, <laughs> but at the same time, it's very visual and it's, yeah. you know, and it's, it's kind of, it's entertaining for the, the lay person as well. Um, so he's got that kind of mixed bag. Chris Harris mentioned that too, that it was a combination of his drum core experience with his street drumming experience. Um, however, if you go to a place like New Orleans, I think it's a little bit more raw. Mm-hmm. You know, when you watch the, you know, if you go to New Orleans today, there's lots of kids on the streets uh, playing like just these bucket grooves. And they play almost all single strokes. Um, usually there's a little bit of swing in the groove, uh, you know, very, you know, kind of funk shuffly, kind of zip, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of like really cool, just tasty groove, yeah. but they're playing it with a lot of, vo- a lot of power, right. And a lot of, um, intensity. And as I watch their hands, cause I've, I spent a couple of weeks in new Orleans, just watching street drummers. Um, and as, as I was watching their hands, they're, you know, they're, they're they don't have, you know, palms down, you know, perfect grip, maximizing, uh, you know, they're not keeping their stick low to the ground. You know, it's very loose, um, but it's a lot of it's coming from the elbow. <laughs> you know, you're like, what? You know, but they're, <laughs> they're powerful drummers. And yeah. as someone who's, t- you know, taught that kind of, you know, uh, indoor percussion, like I see that and I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, it's not, you know, how we teach it, but there's something vibrant about it. And I guess fresh about the way they approach it. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. And you, the fact that you mentioned kids um, as well, because I think kids, uh, you know, that also helps to sell things for people and to uh, get them to, like, give the, you money because the goal, whole goal is to get a tip for your plane, you know, so um, I'm sure kids do pretty well. Yeah, kids do really well. Actually, so my son would drum with me in when I was in Washington, D.C. I've done solo drumming as well, um, but when he was old enough, I took him out and He's, you know, he's not, he's, you know, was like shoulder height. And there was a couple of times where I would step away and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to go, you know, get some sodas or whatever. And he's like, Oh, I'll just keep drumming dad. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then he come, I come back and he made more money. And those little bit of time that we had like the last 15 minutes, because you know, he's, he's a cute little kid just sitting there drumming and he's got pretty good chops. Yeah. So yeah, the, the kit, the cute factor goes a long way for sure. Oh, that's funny. Um, all right. So we're, I, I think we're getting to the point here with the buckets. So, um, which is a good, there's, there's a good chunk of the book here talking about, um, bucket drumming, which I think it, it looks like it really kind of came into, uh, you know, popularity in the nineties. Is that correct? Yeah. So the nineties becomes especially, yeah, from a popular lens, there's two key players. I think that, could be considered like the founding fathers, if you will, of, of bucket drumming. So one is a guy named Larry Wright. Um, and he's out of New York city and he was featured in the nineties, like crazy. Like he's on Levi's commercials. He has like this meetup with Max Roach. Oh, wow. um, he's kind of, yeah, he, yeah. And, and there, he even got the, he was awarded the, um, buddy rich Memorial scholarship. 
um, which his performance on that is epic. Like mm. it's, it's awesome. He just, he just rips through all the, he kind of took like almost like everything he does and just put it into this one concise performance. That's really cool. Wow. Um, and, and Larry Wright still plays today. Um, and you can see him and, you know, subways in New York, uh, on the streets in New York. But basically he was, you know, he kind of grew up in, um, rough circumstances. Um, and he ended up going and, and kind of trying to figure out ways to make money. And, uh, there was one day where he just, you know, grabbed some old buckets, you know, cause he got some kind of drum chops from school bands, right? We talked about where drummer street drummers get their chops and it's kind of, varied but he kind of like got some chops from learning music in school and then went out and started drumming and uh, he went into um a main area uh, and made like 300 bucks like wow. just playing on some flipped over buckets and you know and then he just kind of took off people took notice of him uh he became very popular very fast um and he became like i said like kind of the founder uh, or one of the founders of this style uh, the other person that is uh, is really important to know is a guy named um, John Bryant, who is the um, he's actually the founder of the Bucket Boys, uh, which are out of Chicago, the Chicago Bucket Boys. Today, the Chicago Bucket Boys they play for the Chicago Bulls. You can see them pretty much at any Bulls game, um, and they're they're a mainstay. But the thing that's interesting about his legacy and there was a couple other drummers um uh john uh, john bryant there was a guy named michael long who kind of kind of doubled up with him um and some uh, deshaun lewis and some other drummers but they kind of they started drumming and playing i'm like hey i'd like to um he basically took like a mop bucket flipped it over started playing earned a little bit of money and then he got with other drummers uh and kind of unified or created a uniform approach Hmm. And the thing why I find that so fascinating is I used to live not too far from Chicago and I would go see the bucket boys all the time, especially outside of the art Institute of Chicago um, or on the city streets, but they were always different groups, but they would play the same rhythms and grooves. Hmm. And that was really cool. And so what he would do or what they would do, I should say the bucket boys do is they have kind of this set set of grooves that they play in uniform and unison and then they're improvising. So you'll hear like this kind of like this do 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 right. And they're kind of doing it with like some flashy stick tricks and twirls that are uniform. Then all of a sudden there'll be a stop, and then one of the drummers will take a little solo, and then they'll play the groove, and then another drummer will take a solo. So they kind of created almost like a call and response type system that is pretty standardized. And today you can see bucket drummers, like I said, everywhere. Yeah. Off of freeway entrances in downtown, uh, next to Wrigley Field, they're all over. Yeah. And I mean, like, you're absolutely right. I, I, everywhere I've gone that has some sort of a, uh, you know, if you see a stadium or something, there's usually uh, a bucket drummer playing next to them. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure that it varies in city to city and drummer to drummer, but I've always wondered, and, uh, you know, you never really want to ask about, money with stuff but i mean can a bucket drummer make this a full-time job and do pretty well and uh support themselves i mean i feel like the answer is probably yes but like i mean you know it takes a lot of work but how do they how do they usually end up you know doing at the end of the day yeah so this is a very interesting topic so larry wright like i said still plays today um, and he does it exclusively full-time. In fact, he had offers. I've mentioned the Buddy Rich Memorial Scholarship. He had offers to go to college and study music and do all these things. He didn't do any of that. He's still basically just street drums. He's done commercials. In fact, uh, uh, there's another person, uh, I think his brother, Chocolate Jared, who mm -hmm. also does, he actually did some really cool stuff. Like he did some WWE commercials, which I I think is maybe one of the, apexes of bucket drumming because he creates this composition that features like he creates this just beautiful tension with his grooves and mm -hmm. then it culminates to this climax in the in the commercial it's it's really cool 
Um, but anyways, but he, you know, there's some featured moments where they're kind of paid to come in and do something, you know, very commercial, but Larry Wright, who now plays on the streets with his wife is just playing cause that's what he loves to do. And he makes a good amount of money doing it. Um, there's a video with, uh, oh shoot, Cornelio, who's another street drummer, um, in New York city. And he's like, I make easily $400 in a day drumming on the streets wow. you know without with you know not even breaking a sweat and his his setup is actually like a just a little top section of a free floating snare and then a um and a sound system and he just come out he just comes out and plays on top of that to like hip-hop grooves and stuff hmm. man 400 bucks a day is not bad if you're uh doing it every day and you have a pretty uh it's not like you're putting that much money back into i mean if you have to buy a new bucket or something, which actually kind of raises the question of um, when I I did it once with my brother where we, you know, took some buckets that may have already been, uh, I guess you could say compromised where they were just old five gallon, you know, like a bucket from Lowe's or something. And it may have already been a little bit broken, but I remember we went downtown and played um, kind of by what's called Fountain Square here, which, you know, there's people there. There's a street. So that's the place to be. Um, but I remember the, uh, the bucket as it was flipped over, it did b- crack and it broke, um, on the bottom as I was playing. Yeah. How often does that happen? I mean, how often do people go through buckets? Well, I think that depends a little bit on, uh, on the player. So like Chris Harris, who I said was, uh, kind of the, he was down in Florida, um, and played for the Tampa Bay Rays. He, uh, would actually, he brings out a stack of buckets. He brings like 12 buckets out. And he carries him like in like a, um, I think he said like a, uh, you know, a baby carriage or something. And he <laughs> comes out and you know sets him up. And because that's one of the other things is mobility is very difficult with with street drumming. Yeah. Um, whether you know, there's I love sometimes there's these memes where it'll show like s- somebody took like a, um, oh what is it? I've seen like where there's like a bicycle with a drum set inside of it. Yeah. Or, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, where was, I should have thought of that when I was street drumming (laughs) or, um, I've seen one where there's like a, a hand truck or somebody mounted a bass drum and like a little hi hat and, you know, they, and they're like, they just kind of roll it around and they could set it up. I'm like, that's genius. Yeah. Really? But with bucket drumming, yeah, you do break them. And, um, you know, some of it's nuance and the, the way people play. And of course, you know, the, the bass tone is in the center of the bucket. Um, and the edge is like the snare sound. Some people will flip a bucket over and put change in it oh, and cool. then they'll hit that and that'll make this, you know, like this really cool kind of snare sound. Uh, people play on the side. Um, and a lot of drummers use a lot of sometimes junk. Um, I know you, you know, you told me you had showed me that video from, uh, you playing, I think it was with like your brother or something in yeah. uh, Italy. Yeah, and um, you know, and Domat, who's one Italian drummer, and a guy named Dario Rossi, who's another Italian drummer, they use these massive, <laughs> ridiculous sets. They have like thirty to fifty pieces that they lug out onto the streets in like Rome, and they drum on them. And it's like, and it what? it it like surrounds you. I yeah. mean, it's and I feel like a lot of it too. Uh, and I'll post that video or a link to it so people can see. It's like. Uh, 12 minutes long, which probably you only need to watch about 15 seconds of it to get the, uh, the idea. Cause after I did not watch the whole thing. After no, <laughs> neither did I. Um, but it's like almost like it's, it's almost like more than what could be played in general. So it's like, it seems like some of this with these setups and you actually in your book have a really cool picture of a drummer. Um, I believe in Italy where you're surrounded and you're kind of kneeling around it. And there's almost like more than what could be played. So I wonder how much of it is kind of visual. Like it gives you this big footprint that just looks really cool. So I'm, I'm sure I'm assuming that's a part of it, but um, even there you saw almost this in Europe. It's more of like, from what I've gathered is like, I say junk in a good way, but like really like everything uh, and I think in your book, you said something like, you know, your European street drumming, everything, including the kitchen sink, uh, where it's like, it's everything. I mean, there is like, if you have something in your house that makes a sound, bring it, throw it on the street and play it, you know? 
Yeah, and I think I think street drummers do consciously think about the timbre. You know, they're thinking like, oh, here's the quality of this sound, and I want this. You know, this sounds kind of like a sizz, or this has a sound um, that I really, you know, that I really like, or this has a unique sound. You know, it sounds like one of those. Um, I don't know. I think Afro percussion made like this thing. It was a ribbon ribbon slap or something like that. You know, these different kind of sounds, and they try to recreate them. But you do bring up a point that the set ups of some of these massive setups they're like you could never play all of it at once yeah it reminds me of like you know like neil pert's drum set you know like sure. where he, it was kind of like he almost had four or five drum sets within one drum set yeah so he would play zone you know and i think <laughs> it was the same thing with these when i as i've watched drummers like domat and dario rossi where they just have so much crap that they almost play in this section and then they'll transition to this section and they'll yeah. transition to this section. They never play it all at once. Yeah. Which totally nothing wrong with that. And that that's actually a good way to put it because also you're, you're out there all day. So it's kind of fun to like switch up zones. And, um, and in my experience with that one event where my brother and I, we were in Europe and there was a street drummer and we were, he was playing and I don't even know how it happened, but he had extra sticks for people to go up and join him. Is that frowned upon by street drummers for people to be like, can I play with you? Or is that like a part of it ever for in, in America? I think when they invite you, it's cool. So like uh, one of the, one of the drummers uh, I mentioned, who's a mod, who's a current drummer and has been featured in a lot of different places, Matthew pretty, he's known as bucket boy. Um, and he's probably the second highest like viewed um, street drummer currently. And, um, he has one of his biggest things is he always incorporates the audience into his music. And so he's sitting there, you know, kind of hitting stuff and, or he, he has like them hold, you know, buckets and hold pan, pans and stuff for them. Um, or he'll, um, you know, he'll have them clap rhythms or do different things with them. So there's always this interactive element and bongo joe used to do that too he would have the audience do stuff with him and interact um some too so it i think par that's part of the entertainment factor right historically and even in modern drummers they're yeah. trying to you know they want to keep people's attention because the longer they stay the more money they'll probably give yeah and that's an important part of it yeah and <sighs> Things have changed, though, and you just kind of said one of the most viewed drummers, which you have a section in uh, your book that's titled YouTube Crazy. And we've all seen that where like even on Facebook or Instagram or, or, or TikTok or whatever, they're all kind of connected where videos sort of like float between platforms, obviously, um, where you see this these street performers, be it a singer, guitarist, where uh, they're like, you can be like a breakout star. Like, I forget her name. There's a girl in England who's got an amazing voice uh, where or in Ireland, I think, actually. And you see her perform and it's like, my God, you're incredible. And she is a, it appears that she's always performing on the street. Um, so maybe go into a little detail about how YouTube really changed uh, the world for street drummers and it. I'm just going to throw it out there that is it or ask the question too along those those lines is it the drummer who is kind of having someone film them and uploading it themselves or is this is this also like a a natural someone uploads a video on their account of a drummer and then magic happens maybe without the drummer even knowing it kind of thing Yeah that's a really good question so so in 2005 obviously YouTube launches and by within a year the um, street drummers are already a pretty mainstay part of it. Um, so from its inception, we see drummers really kind of taking off. Sp specifically, some of the earliest drum videos were actually Larry Wright and um, the Bucket Boys out of Chicago, those kind of founding groups. Um, so, but you bring up a really interesting point because there's actually a couple people I mentioned my, in, my, uh, in my book who I call them regional drummers or kind of like kind of little almost one hit wonders. Sure. Um, there was a guy like in, I think it's, um, I think he's Philadelphia and he, um, he's got like one video with millions of views. He didn't record it. It was just some random person kind of was like, dude, check it out. 
and he just does these like freaking awesome beats right where he's mm. you know he's he's like using the side of like an old um drawer in a you know metal drawer in a refrigerator and he's using it like a, a like a guiro and he's wow. like you know, you know like playing this really sweet groove you know and it's like got like kind of like a hip-hop funky shuffly kind of thing and it's just a great video but anyways yeah, what, what's yeah. interesting about it is he's using kind of miscellaneous stuff and it's just a random person just recording him where some street drummers use more of a um they have more of a brand and so they're protecting their brand and they're like hey check out my video gordo is a great example of this you know he's getting i guess credit right for his hits and yep. then he collaborates with other influencers and they might take a video of him of, or something. And so, and then the person will interview him or whatever. So he's kind of created a brand. Some people don't have that brand. Some street drummers, um, there's a guy in Washington, DC, uh, who's not hard to find if you're in like the, the mall area, the Nas national mall, uh, he plays basically carries his stuff around in a, um, a shopping cart. And I do mention him. Um, but he's just got like a bunch of big buckets and some like pylon, you know, street cones, um, which I don't, I'm not sure how he got those, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> but he, you know, but he just sets it up and he'll just start drumming. He's got no YouTube presence. All the videos that exist of him, which are very small are just random people taking them, you know? So it really depends, I think on the drummer and what they, I guess, do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, it's not, it's sort of a sticky situation too, where it's like if someone shoots a video that gets, I mean, somehow, you know what, it's it's like the stars align and that video then gets uh, 10 million views and maybe they're set up to be monetized on YouTube, which isn't an automatic thing. You kind of have to get to it and then set it up. And then, you know, it's it's not to say that if someone's getting a bunch of views on a video, they're automatically getting paid. But uh, that's money possibly that is not going to that performer. Um, but that's also getting into a, into a whole legal situation with YouTube in general, um, which it's just a whole other thing. But um, all right. So we're getting here. I think we're, we're kind of getting up to the modern days, obviously of street drumming. Why don't we talk about um, where it stands today, how you think the, the state of the union is with street drumming. And then um, maybe we, we can get into some tips for people who maybe haven't done it, who want to do it and just don't know the legality of it or, you know, some gear recommendations. But, um, but yeah, where, where is it all as it, you know, as it stands today? Yeah. So I think that's, that's a great question. So there are people, there's kind of been a bit of a resurgence, um, of the art form and some interest in it. Um, I mentioned too, just on America's Got Talent alone, you've got mm -hmm. Malik Dope who was recently, um, featured, uh, like I think it was like last year, and then there was also a few years back a group called Recycled Percussion, and they had done you know they kind of incorporated street style drumming along with like kind of heavy metal vibes with you know power tools and stuff. So we're seeing this you know, and then YouTube also has like as you mentioned really expanded street drumming um, a lot. Where um, you know I was able to communicate with like like I said I interviewed a guy from New Zealand. I talked to a guy from Canada. Um, I talked to those drummers in Boston um, and, you know, I interviewed all these individuals and they were all doing different, unique stuff, um, you know, but street drumming is also fun because I think it's authentic. It's raw. Um, and, you know, like you said, if just there's that little clip, that video, you know, it can become viral fairly quick. Sure. The thing that is hard, um, and this is the thing that I think, you know, you know, there's lots of organizations, um, you know, like I, I talk about fuse drumming as one example um, in New Zealand where they're playing, you know, they're teaching kids how to basically do urban drumming, urban percussion, street drumming and bucket drumming. And they teach them stuff like, you know, doom, ga, doom, doom, ga, or do do ga, goom, goom, ga, goom, do do ga, goom, right? But mm -hmm. the thing that separates, I guess, the pros, right? The people who are on the street making money doing it is uh, from you know kind of the novices and intermediates like maybe that are taught in the school is that skill set right the ability to play a groove and then on top you know and make it interesting you know where it's like you got this do ka do 
God, while that's continuing, it goes, dink, 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 you know, while, mm-hmm. and you're playing all this stuff. So I think modern street drummers especially have a great deal of um, independence in their, their capabilities, yeah. you know, and sometimes that stuff is insanely impressive because you got guys who are playing kind of like drum set type stuff. Um, but you also have people who are playing on a single bucket and it sounds like a drum set. And that's, that's pretty exciting when they'll totally. start creating and putting different tamers and but tambers. And they're still like adding more and more layers to the groove. And then all this, it's just this crazy polyrhythmic thing. And you're just like, that was so awesome. You know? And I think that's what street drumming is today. It's, it's, um, there's an element of new to it, but also innovation. Um, one person that just popped in my head is this guy named Masa, the drummer uh, from Japan. And he is, uh, he does, he plays didgeridoo and street, and it's a custom made like PVC didgeridoo. Cool. And then he plays like EDM style grooves underneath it with like kind of trash percussion. Um, and he makes some really, really cool music. That's um, awesome. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool what he does. Yeah. I mean, you can do as much. And then that's that's almost like there's like these categories of like just a straight bucket drummer. And then there's someone who's doing like one man band type stuff like that, where they have more of a, a tonal instrument on top of it. Um, it's kind of cool. That there's no there's no set rules. And also, like, I mean, really, the guy who you could just have never played the drums before, get a bucket, get some sticks and just go out and start figuring it out. And albeit, you know, you might really kind of annoy everyone around you because you're not going to be that great up front, but nothing's stopping you from doing that. I mean, you might not get many tips or anything, but I feel like there's no, uh, it's kind of equal opportunity with, um, with just getting a bucket and going out there. Like you can, you can do it. I'm sure you'll do better if you are putting in the hours practicing, but, um, there's no, eh, whatever you can, you get a corner, you can go out and do it. Yeah, and I like I love that idea. So one of my favorite things about being a drummer is our community. I love the drum community because I find that, you know, every place I've played uh, professionally, and you know, I do host some drum circles and other things locally. You know, just to kind of get back to my community. But I always find that drummers want to share. Yeah. Like they just are really cool. Like you know, when I was at different bands, you know, trumpet players are like, "No, dude, that's my lick." Or guitar <laughs> players, I think they get kind of that like. You know, even even Robert Johnson, you know, from back blues artist, he would play to a wall so people couldn't see his hands. You know, he yeah, Eddie Van see. Halen and stuff. Yeah, yeah. He would do like, that. But drummers were like, do it. He like, oh, you want to learn how to play that? Let me show you. You know, it's not my lick. You know, I'm gonna teach it to you. Yeah. And I, you know, and thinking about, I like what you said that anybody can do it from a novice to a pro. And the thing that I recommend is for especially people maybe getting into it. Um, or maybe have a little bit of chops, or maybe you have a lot of chops, but having one or two really good grooves to go out with is yeah. probably the best way to start. Because remember, the audience, as you noted, changes. Mm-hmm. Most people listen to you for about 30 seconds, yeah. if that. You know, So if you've got two or three really solid grooves, and then you can improvise and we didn't even talk about that. You know, that's in the book, but improvisation is a huge part of this art form um, because that's what, you know, keeps it interesting for the performer. Um, But, you know, just having a nice solid foundation to start and then starting to expand and learn and learn, that's going to help, you know, somebody really grow and get into it. Um, I remember my son and I were playing a set once and there was another bucket drummer um, or another street drummer in the area and he was playing a set down the road like just a little bit down from us and then he actually came over um and he was you know technically our competition but he you know wasn't quite as um skilled and seasoned the drummer as us and we sat with him actually he had him sit in our set we showed him a couple grooves he added them into his set and then he went and started playing you know and he he added those new rhythms and i was just like that to me that's what it's about you know it's it's trying to I guess, teach the next generation of street drummers. Um, I mean, that's, that's awesome because he is competition. He is literally like, like you said, he's not that far from you and he, you taught him and then he went and took your style and kind of did it down the road. But, but that's, you know, that's what drumming is, is we share with each other. And, and also with drumming, typically nowadays, 
I mean, what we all do in some capacity, just by the nature of the drums, has kind of been done before. It's like playing the two four, you know, yeah. beat. It's like you can do it in a lot of different ways, but it's not like that's the difference between that and a piano or whatever, where you can, you know, it's it's just how drums are. Um, so, and then one thing I want to ask before we could talk about uh, tips for people who want to get into this is, um, all right. So my my two experiences of of street drumming that I had, the one in Europe, and then the one here where I said I went out with my brother and the bucket broke. But when we first started, we were outside of a building downtown Cincinnati which it turned out was a federal building. And they pretty quickly came out and said, this is like a federal building. You cannot sit here or whatever. Go, go further down. Um, how does that work with uh, the businesses around you? Because like we're talking about, the turnover is pretty quick on an audience. But at the, let's say, like, um, you know, women's clothing store or the coffee shop that you're kind of like, 15 feet away from if you were playing a four hour set and you're going all day and they may, may might not want to hear that all day. How does that work with the <laughs> local businesses? Yeah. So that's a, that's, you know, I, I dedicate an entire chapter to this. So we're, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to be able to pull it apart in this few seconds, but I, that's a great question. So with a federal building, what, what, DC was a great example of the federal buildings, right? Because sure. everything out down there is owned by the government. And um, it was interesting if you played on one side of the site, like one, so you're on the sidewalk. And if you played on the side closest to the building, it was illegal. But if you played on the side closest to the curb next to the street, it was legal. Hmm. So we, and we even had one time, cause we used to play out in front of Wash, uh, in front of the white house, which is a really great spot to play. Um, but the we i remember we set up one time and we started playing and then the cop came over and he's like you can't play here we're like what there's people everywhere and there's other performers he's like no he's like you have to move three feet onto this section this is basically legal and Jeez. this is not legal so you know one of the things that i do recommend and that is knowing what the rules are wherever you live yeah. um you know the, well, the guy carl uh down in in uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, he is he's they have a permit system there, and they're only allowed to play for like I think it's fifty minutes in each spot, and Whoa. they're really strict about it. And so he, you know, he mentions that part of that system, what works for it, is that he's at a spot like you know in front of a bakery or something, and they're only going to hear him for fifty minutes, and then he moves on. Yeah. Where if you do set up and you're like, I'm here for four hours, you know, that can be droning. And one of the biggest challenges is a lot of times those business owners, they also are friends with city council members, mayors, law enforcement. And so they can cause a lot of strife for drummers yeah. um, and, you know, street musicians in general. And so knowing the rules, um, knowing the laws, we even got you know, in with some store owners when we played in DC because there was no public bathrooms near where we were. So, you know, we always kind of frequent in those places and they would let us use the bathroom and things. So those are logistical things. Again, I, I talk about in the book, but those are things that you got to consider, right? Yeah. You're going to be out there for a long time. How do you get food? How do you drink? You can't leave your spot because somebody else will take it. Yeah. And depending on the city, Dep depends on the rules that you have to adhere to and it changes from place to place. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, again, just, uh, your, your book, like I could very quickly kind of flip through as you're talking and be like, Oh, there's the page that says blurred lines. It can be difficult to know where street drumming is allowed. And it's like, if you really do have an interest in doing this or in a background, and I'm not trying to be too salesy with it or anything, but I, I, I really am enjoying your book just to know these things um, about it. Cause God, you know, it sounds, uh, I've, it hasn't, I mean, it was probably 12 or 13 years ago that I did that with my brother and it sounds like a lot of fun to go and do it again. Um, and, and just get out there. Um, so, uh, then let's transition into here. So, so how does someone, what do you recommend gear wise uh maybe things i so you said have a couple rhythms kind of ready to go in mind you know which if you're if you're an experienced drummer shouldn't be a problem at all let's assume no. people people listening to this podcast um are drummers they have a little bit of a background in that but 
What kind of gear, what kind of stuff do you think they should have to go out? Because on the cover, you've got a hi-hat stand. You've got kind of arms going across with tambourines and little stacks. And your son has like bent license plates and stuff that he's playing, which is really, really cool. Um, but kind of what would be the intro that you would give to people on, on what they should start with? Yeah, I think the first thing is you got to know yourself, right? So the your capabilities are a big part of that. Um, you know, drummers that play on a single bucket, um, you know, and I've, I've played sets on single buckets. You got to have some serious chops to do it. Um, you know, cause you got to be able to keep it interesting. That's a big part of it. Um, the other thing is mobility. Where are you? How are you getting from place to place? Um, I was talking to some, some drummers, they can kind of pull up and they're not too far from the location. When I was in Washington, D.C., we had to go blocks and blocks to get mm. to our place. And so we would load all our gear up on a skateboard, and then we would shift it over there, and then we'd set up really quick. And our setup was pretty simple. We used five, you know, we brought like five buckets out, and I had a mini hi-hat that had two splashes, and then I took a hi-hat stand and like cut it down. Um, mm. And we also use a rubber made bucket that we kind of use as a base. Um, so we kind of created like almost like a hybrid drum set street percussion thing because that's where my strength lies yeah um, so to me i think knowing your strength is a big part of it uh some people if you if you're a minimalist drummer that works really good you know just a simple small kick drum you know 18 20 inch and then you know a, a snare drum and then a hi-hat if you can do that um i've seen people go out with not not terry bozio style but you know, i've seen people come out with some <laughs> you know pretty regular sized drum sets um, this is very popular, especially in London, uh, yeah. where there's, you know, they've got like a regular five piece kit and they're out there just kind of, you know, playing like, you know, the, I call it the guitar center beat, you know, the, sure. big, <laughs> you know, little kind of drum and bass thing. Yep. Um, you know, so like that's to me, that's the starting point. It's what gear do you have? Can you move it? Um, I do, I think the simplest setup, honestly, is to do a bucket and a symbol mm -hmm. and when i say a symbol I'm, which kind of is fun because if you, if you go back to gene palma <laughs> right back in the day uh gene palma was just playing on a snare drum and a cymbal and um so one of the things a lot of drummers do i know carl does this uh is they put like a hi-hat on the ground you know take a hi-hat bottom you put it on the ground and if you put your foot on it even on the concrete you can actually get like a tss, 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 yeah, you get like that, you know, that lifted hi hat or closed hi hat, and so they'll play like you know, and then on the left hand, say doom, ga, doom, doom, ga. So you got, you know, so you're putting that whole groove together, um, which requires some serious, you know, some independence. Sure. But if you've got a hi hat and the bucket, you can also play on the concrete. You can play, you know, sticks. Um, you know, you can play all sorts of different sounds. Um, but that's to me like a really basic way to do it. Yeah, that's neat. And and so legally, there's no with permits and stuff. I guess there wouldn't technically be any difference between bringing a five piece uh, drum set with like two crashes and a ride and hi hats versus playing a single bucket. Um, you know what I mean? Like it, it almost kind of thinks like it makes it makes me think those are two separate things. Um, because the footprint and just the volume of a drum set, but I guess they're treated the same legally, right? It depends again on the city. So okay, that's, okay. that's a good question. So Decibel, some, so it's, it, this is an interesting and really, I guess, complicated topic. Um, that's why it, it, it's pretty, you know, I get pretty in depth with it sure. in the book, but the, um, so there was actually a Supreme court case where the um free basically the freedom of expression um they, there was this city that tried to outlaw um actually a few cities tried to outlaw street performers and they cited it as being dangerous that it was not safe for people to do street performing um the supreme court sided with this is the united states supreme court um sided with the performers saying well the first of all there hasn't been really any or very few instances where this has occurred where a safety issue has come out about but also mm -hmm. more importantly um that the right of or the freedom of speech aspect of it supersedes the um 
the I guess the danger. And so that's one of the reasons Washington DC where I played was such a great place to play is because it was permitted because it was just like somebody protesting or somebody trying to, you know, put a message out there. Um, you, and you not, the one rule that's almost universal though, is you cannot ask for tips. You can have a bucket out and people can put money in it, but you cannot actively say, Hey, you know, you can't be like Mary Poppins, you know, Bert and Mary Poppins and walk around with a hat and say, can I have some money? Wow. Um, you have to, you have to just leave it there. And if people put money in, you're good. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. Boy, I didn't know that. Um, I mean, that's, there's so many little, uh, kind of nuances where I guess you would, if you go out and do it trial and error, you'd probably find stuff out about, about this um, just by hitting the streets and, and doing it. So you can also just talk to, like you can just talk to um, call local law enforcement. They'll, there's codes and they can tell you like um, even here in, in where I live in Washington, like Seattle and stuff um, or even Portland, not too far South of us. Um, they have restrictions, but as long as you know where you can play in the city, it's not a big deal. And I just like to note that that Supreme Court case was Goldstein and town of Nantucket. And then another mm -hmm. one was Davenport and Alexandria, Virginia. So there was some pretty big cases that were related to this. Yeah, man, so much research. I mean, it's uh, again, the book is called Street Drumming, The People, History and Grooves. And I just really think it's cool because I want to hear now a little bit about as we wrap up you know, what got you into this, but it's just neat that you are, a, you know, a PhD recipient, like you're a doctor and you're just for the joy of it. And I, I also, as a dad, I think it's really cool that you with your son are out there doing this. I mean, there's nothing more like just, uh, that's just such a cool activity to be doing. Um, cause you're kind of teaching like, um, I don't know, put yourself out there, play in front of people. There's nothing to be nervous about. Uh, you know, you're, you're being really, uh, you're, you're kind of using your brain to put together this kind of small drum set and then you got to carry it and you got to work for it. It's a lot of, it teaches a lot of lessons. Um, but so what got you into this, um, you know, in general to, to begin with? Yeah. So I think it's, I, I, historic, I guess for myself, historic, my history, right. Um, I think I saw, I remember the first time I saw a street drummer. Um, I grew up in San Diego, California, and I, and I went to a trip to New York City uh, when I was in high school band, right? You know, I was playing, you know, center snare, you know, chuck it, chuck it, you know, type stuff. And then um, I remember we marched in like a, a parade back there and, and played like a field show. And I remember coming out of a, um, a subway stop and, and hearing a street drummer, and I was just completely interested in it. Um, years later, um, when I was in Europe, I ran into a couple street drummer, you know, street drummers uh, playing in a couple cities. And then when I was ended up living in the Washington D.C. area uh, because of my role uh, as a musician, I ended up having. I was just like, you know, it'd be really cool to kind of do this street drumming thing because it's pretty easy to do in this area, um, and we really spent a lot of time creating a setup that was unique. You know, we tried to offer something that we hadn't seen anybody else do. Yeah. Um, and so as we were doing that, I was like, well, Hey bud, do you want to, you know, talking to my oldest son, Milt, I said, Hey, do you want to, you want to go do this? And he's like, Oh yeah, that'd be cool. I'm like, and you'll make money. And he's like, well, that's even better. Um, so I really actually used it kind of as a, a lesson in entrepreneurship and how, what we do as drummers can be lucrative. And he learned very quickly, you know, that you know, he had friends who were working at McDonald's and, you know, Arby's <laughs> and, and they'd be like, yeah, I'm making this money. And he's like, oh, I made that in like <laughs> five minutes, you know? Yeah. So like for him, you know, and of course there was a lot of work that went into it. And there was a few times I, you know, I'd say that, you know, sincerely, um, but at the same time, and joking, I guess, but there was also times where we, you know, it was a loss where we go out and it starts to rain yeah, and we make, twenty dollars it didn't even cover our transportation to get to the gig you know yeah. so and also that was an important lesson to be like look dude this is a business you know you're putting yourself out there you're taking all the risk you know you got to pay for sticks because every we went through a lot of sticks you got to pay for buckets 
you know, the metal stuff that we're playing that looks all cool and shiny, that stuff dies, you know, you can, you can destroy a hubcap, you know, like, so all those little things die over time and you have to invest. And so to me, that was maybe one of the greater lessons from a dad perspective. But I also mentioned in the book, you know, that street drumming is a business. There's people that make a full-time living of it. Chris Harris is probably the greatest example. He even, there's even a section where I talk about pay your taxes and he's really yes. adamant about that. He's like, look, he's like, if you, it's a legitimate business. He's like, I, I've bought my house, my car, you know, I run my whole life because I, this, I look at this uh, and he's able to get loans and other things because his street drumming is what he does and he claims it. And the bank is like, yeah, you're consistently making, you know, X, Y, Z dollars and you know, it's viable. Yeah. Awesome. Well, John, I am so uh, just happy to have had you on here to talk about the great book, Street Drumming, um, and uh, and just meet you and, and hear more about this. Um, and uh, John was kind enough to stick around for a little bit and do a Patreon bonus episode, um, which, John, I think it, we, we talked a little bit before. I think it'd be cool to hear about maybe one or two stories of when things uh, people like the drama about when things maybe didn't go so well or something broke or just kind of some uh, some craziness happened out on the streets, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, we could totally do that. John, why don't you tell people here as we're kind of finishing up where they can get this awesome book? Yeah, so you can um, get it at two places. One, you can get it on Amazon.com. Uh, just look up Street Drumming, uh, the, put the title in. Um, street Drumming, the people, history of the gro- and grooves. Or you can uh, pick it up at my website, which is johnowensdrums.com. Cool. Awesome. And like I said, I highly recommend it. I don't have much background in street drumming. I've done a few things, but it's just fun to look at. And it's very, um, uh, like I said, it's just, it's got great pictures and it's kind of a, a resource, like a, like a handbook to just quickly get through and find stuff and, um, and learn a little bit more. So John, thank you so much for being here and um, and sharing your immense knowledge and sending me the book. I've just loved it. Um, it's been an honor to talk to you about this. Yeah, it's been a blast. And uh, yeah, keep drumming. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. <laughs>